قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد I welcome everyone back to the third session that is being held in this series of the biographies of the eminent scholars of hadith from the book Taqdimatul Ma'rifa bi Kitab al Jarwa Tadil of the Imam the Hafiz Ibn Abi Hatim al Razi Rahimahullah. In our, in our previous two sessions, we covered four Imams from the great Imams of Hadith, the Imams of the science of Al Jarwa Ta'adil, the science of praising and disparaging the narrators of Hadith. The first Imam that we covered was Imam Malik ibn Anas rahimahullah, the Imam of the area of Medina. Then we moved on to the area of Mecca and covered the biography of the Imam of that area, Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Then we left the area of Hijaz which contains the Haramain, Mecca and Medina and move on to the region of Iraq and covered the biography of the Imam of the city of Kufa, Imam Sufyan al Thawri. Then we moved to the city of Al Basra and covered the biography of the Imam of this area, Shu'bah ibn al Hajjaj. These four areas, Medina and Mecca and Kufa and Basra, they were major centers of hadith studies and hadith sciences in those times. And these Imams were from the major scholars of the Atbaw Tabi'een to, to whom the science of hadith in those eras, in their times, ended and reached and then they preserved it, compiled it, collected, memorized it and then either authored books in it or conveyed it and transmitted it to those who came after them. Imam Ibn Abi Hatim al-Razi rahimahullah in this book Taqdimatul Marifa, he has divided the 18 Imams that he has mentioned the biographies of into four levels, the four levels, four tabaqat. In the first level he has mentioned six Imams six Imams, we have covered four of them and today we'll cover, cover the remaining two. The fifth Imam that we'll cover today is Imam Hamad ibn Zayd. Hamad ibn Zayd. Also from the Imams of the Atbaw Tabi'een in the city of Basra. In the city of Basra. And then we will move on to another area from the major centers of Hadith studies in those times, the area of Asham the area of Sham, present-day Syria, and Lebanon, and Palestine, and other areas, other countries in that area. And we'll cover the biography of the Imam of that area, Imam Al-Awza'i. Imam Al-Awza'i. So with this, today, inshallah, we'll finish the biographies of the first level of the Aimma of the Atbaw Tabi'een that Imam Ibn Abi Hatim Al-Razi, rahimullah, has mentioned in his book. Then, inshallah, with the coming lectures, we'll move on to the second level, the, the students of these Imams, the Imams of the Tabi al Atba, who followed these Imams in their path of learning and memorizing and preserving and then teaching and conveying the hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we'll start with the fifth Imam today from the area of Al-Basra also, just like Imam Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj, Imam Hamad ibn Zayd, Hamad ibn Zayd. And as always, we will begin with his name and lineage. He is Abu Ismail. Abu Ismail, this is his kunya. Hamad ibn Zayd ibn Dirham. Hamad ibn Zayd ibn Dirham. 
الزدی البصری الزدی مولاہم البصری الزدی مولاہم البصری We have mentioned in our previous classes this terminology for some of those Imams that have passed with us that Mawlahum, that he is their freed slave or he is ascribed to this, these tribes by way of wala, by way of wala. So we would like to touch upon this topic here today that a person can be from one of the tribes Originally, he is part of this tribe, he is from this tribe, or he is ascribed to this tribe by way of ascription and wala, by way of ascription. From the Imams that are passed with us, who is originally from the tribes that he is ascribed to, is Sufyan al Thawri, Rahimullah. Sufyan al Thawri, we mentioned that he is from the Arabs in originality his lineage meets with the lineage of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the great great grandfathers but the remaining three imams that we mentioned imam malik and sufyan ibn uyayna and shuraba ibn al-hajjaj they are all ascribed to the tribes by way of al-wala by way of al-wala ascription and this ascription is of three types this ascription is of three types the first type is that this scholar he was ascribed to this tribe because he was a freed slave from this tribe he was a freed slave from this tribe and this is the most common ascription maulahum meaning that he was a slave who was freed from by this tribe and this shows the great position and status of this matter in Islam that it has encouraged Islam has come with all rulings to encourage the freeing of slaves and has mentioned great rewards in this regard and it has put conditions and criteria that leads to the abolishment of slavery Islam has come with rules and criteria that eventually led to the abolishment of slavery and it shows that even unlike other religions and other cultures and other uh, people who passed before us even those people who were freed slaves they, re they, they re reached the highest level of authority in the sciences of Islam and all of the Muslims they took them as their Imams and as scholars to be referred to. No one from the Muslims de denied their authority over them by saying and claiming that they were freed slaves. And we are born not in slavery, for example. Rather, all of the Muslims are united on the great status and stature of these great Imams. So this is the first type of wala, that they were freed slaves of these tribes, so they ascribed to these tribes by way of that. From them is Imam Hamad ibn Zaid, who we are discussing his biography. His original city is the city of Sijistan, the city of Sijistan in the area of Iran, in the area of Iran. And one of his grandfathers was captured as a slave in this area and Imam Hamad ibn Zaid he was the freed slave of the great scholar of hadith Jarir ibn Hazim Jarir ibn Hazim Jarir ibn Hazim he is from the tribe of Al-Azd Al-Azd Al-Azdi he is originally from this tribe so Imam Hamad ibn Zaid is ascribed to this tribe by way of this ascription because he was freed by the great Imam Jarir ibn Hazim who was from this tribe Al-Azdi and Jarir ibn Hazim he is from the Thiqat the reliable narrators from the Atba Tabi'in from the Atba Tabi'in similar to him is also Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna who we discussed we said he is from the tribe Al-Hilal Hilali Al-Hilali Mawlahum because he was freed 
by Muhammad ibn Muzahim, who was originally from this tribe. So he was ascribed, ascribed to him by way of this ascription. Similarly to him is Imam Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj. Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj, we said he is al-Ataki, al-Azdi, Mawlahum. Mawlahum, because he was a freed slave, the one who freed him, ascribed, he was originally from this tribe, so he became ascribed to him. The second way of ascription by way of wala is that the ascription is done because someone from the grandfathers of these scholars, he accepted Islam on the hands of a person from originally from this tribe. So he became ascribed to him. An example of that is Imam al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari, he is well known as, his name is Abu Abdullah Muhammad al-Ismail, al-Ju'fi Mawlahum al-Bukhari. Al-Ju'fi Mawlahum. Is he from the tribe of al-Ju'fi originally? No. Rather, one of his great grandfathers, he accepted Islam at the hands of a person who was from the tribe of al-Ju'fi. So he became ascribed to this tribe. He became ascribed to this tribe. His name is Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn Mughira ibn Bardisba al-Ju'fi Mawlahum. As we can see, all of them are Arabic Muslim names except for Bardisba. Bardisba, this is from the great grandfathers of Imam al-Bukhari. He was a Majusi. He was a Majusi upon the religion of the area of Iran and that which comes after it, the fire worshippers. The fire worshippers. But his son, Al-Mughira, he accepted Islam on the hands of a person known as Al-Yaman Al-Ju'fi. Al-Yaman Al-Ju'fi, who was originally from the tribe of Al-Ju'fi. So this family, this lineage became ascribed to this tribe due to this reason that this grandfather accepted Islam on the hands of this person. The third type of ascription by Wala is the ascription of aiding someone else. This family, this lineage, it takes a oath to aid that other tribe. So they are ascribed to this tribe by way of this, by this oath of aiding it. Such as Imam Malik ibn Anas, who we covered. Malik ibn Anas, he is also known as At-Taymi al-Qurashi. At-Taymi al-Qurashi. Is he from the tribe of Quraysh? Is he from the tribe of Banu? No. His grandfathers from his family, his lineage, they had given the oath to the tribe of Taim in Quraysh that they would protect it and aid it. So he became ascribed to this tribe by way of this, uh, by way of this oath. So here uh, we have Imam Hamad ibn Zaid, Al-Azdi Mawlahum, as we mentioned, he is not originally from the tribe of Al-Azd, rather he is ascribed to them by way of being a free slave from this tribe. Al-Basri, Al-Basri, because this is the region he was born in and he resided in and passed away in, the city of Basra in Iraq. Al-Darir, Al-Darir, he is also known as Al-Darir, someone who was blind, someone who was blind. He became blind near the end of his life. He became blind near the end of his life and lived the remaining of his life in blindness. And this is a chance for us to ponder. Many of the scholars of Hadith, it has been re mentioned regarding they, that they were ad darir ad fi akhiri umari, that they became blind at the end of their lives. This was due to the striving they did and the struggles they undertook and bore at that time to seek this knowledge of hadith. They lived in extremely difficult times. They did not have none of the blessings that Allah Ta'ala has blessed us with today. They wrote in the dark, sought knowledge in the dark, uh, under lamps that used to flicker and this caused the sight of many of them to, to vanish and to evaporate by the end of their lives. So they dedicated their entire lives to the point that many of them lost their eyesight in the path of the seeking the knowledge of hadith and preserving it and conveying it to others. 
He is Al-Hafidh, Muhaddith Al-Waqt, Ahad Al-Alam. He is the great memorizer of Hadith, the Muhaddith of his times, one of the foremost scholars of the Muslims, Min Atba Tabi'een, from the, from the followers of the Tabi'een, from the students of the Tabi'een. As far as his birth, then he was born in the year 98 after the Hijrah. Imam Hamad ibn Zayd, he was born in the year 98 after the Hijrah. He himself, he says, that Zamat Ummi Annani Wulidtu Fi Khilafat Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He says that my mother used to tell me, inform me, that I was born in the Caliphate of Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, the great Umawi Caliphate, who was the seventh caliphate of the Umayyad dynasty and he took over the caliphate of the Muslims in the year 99 after the Hijrah. 99 after the Hijrah. And we just mentioned that he was born in the year 98. So they are close, maybe uh, a difference of a few months. So he said, my mother used to estimate that I was born in the caliphate of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah. As far as his teachers, then they are the major scholars of the Tabi'een, the major scholars of the Salaf of this, of this Islamic nation, of this Ummah. Ham, Imam Hamad ibn Zayd sought the knowledge of Hadith and the knowledge of Islam from great scholars such as Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani. From his teachers, it's Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani and Thabit al-Bunani and Anas ibn Sirin and Amr ibn Dinar and Hisham ibn Urwa and Ubaidullah ibn Umar and other than them from the major scholars of the Tabi'een from the major scholars of the Tabi'een Abu Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, Thabit al-Bunani, Anas ibn Sirin, Amr ibn Dinar, Hisham ibn Urwa and Ubaidullah ibn Umar and other than them as far as his students then they are vast in number they are vast in number students from all over the Muslim lands they travel to him to hear and to study and to seek the knowledge of hadith from him. From his well-known students are Sufyan al-Thawri, Imam Sufyan al-Thawri and Imam Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj. And they are from his teachers who narrated hadith from him. Imam Sufyan al-Thawri and Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj, they are older than him. And they are in the rank of his teachers. But due to the knowledge that he had gained and the proficiency in the science of hadith, they also heard some hadith that they did not have in their position and narrated on the authority of their students of theirs, Hamad ibn Zayd. From his well-known students, it's also Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak and Abdurrahman ibn al-Mahdi and Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan and Imam Ali ibn al-Madini, these great imams of this science, the foremost scholars of the science of hadith, they are all from his students. As far as the praise of the scholars upon this great Imam and the great status and position he reached in the science of Hadith, then we have mentioned this statement of Imam Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi from his foremost students. Before in our previous biographies, in the biography of Imam Malik and in the biography of Sufyan al-Thawri, that he says, أَيْمَّةُ النَّاسِ فِي زَمَانِهِمْ أَرْبَعَ سُفْيَانَ الثَّوْرِ بِالْكُوفَةِ وَمَالِكٌ بِالْحِجَازِ وَالْأَوْزَاعِ بِالشَّامِ وَحَمَّادُ بْنُ زَيْدِ بِالْبَصْرَةِ That the Imams of the Muslims in the time of the Atbaw Tabi'een, then they are four in number. From those four, who are they? Sufyan al-Thawri, Imam Sufyan al-Thawri in the region of Kufa. And Imam Malik in the region of Hijaz, in the region of Hijaz. And Imam Al-Awza'i in, in the region of Asham and Hamad ibn Zayd in the region of Al-Basra, in the region of Basra. Imam Yahya ibn Yahya al nisaburi he says, Ma ra'aytu shaykhan ahfadha min Hamad ibn Zayd. That I have not met any teacher and shaykh of mine who I heard and learned hadith from who had more ahadith, the quant the quantity of ahadith that he had memorized more in number than Hamad ibn Zayd. I never met anyone who had more ahadith memorized, the number of ahadith, the quantity of ahadith than Hamad ibn Zayd. And this is regarding the quantity. What about the quality, the precision of his memory? 
and the exactness of his of his retention ability imam yahya ibn ma'in imam al jarwa ta'dil the imam of praising and criticizing narrators he says laysa ahadun athbat min hamad ibn zaid even with this great amount of ahadith that he had memorized the great number of ahadith and quantity the quality was not affected that i have never seen imam yahya ibn ma'in said uh, there's no one who is more precise in his memory than Hamad ibn Zaid. There's no one who is more precise in, in the memorization of hadith than Hamad ibn Zaid. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah, he says, Hamad ibn Zaid min aimmatil muslimin min ahli din that Hamad ibn Zaid is from the imams of the Muslims and he from the religion of Islam. He's the imams of the people who ascribe to the religion of Islam. Imam Sufyan al thawri rahimahullah, as we mentioned, he is from the teachers and shuyukh of Imam Hamad ibn Zaid and also from his students who has narrated a hadith from him. He says, Rajulun bil basra ba'da shu'ba zaak al azraq, yani Hamadan, that the, showing the progression of this knowledge in the city of Basra to whom the science of hadith reached and revolved around in this area he said that after Shu'bah who was this, as we mentioned in our previous class he was a contemporary of Imam Sufyan al-Thawri in the same tabaqa in the same level they passed one year apart from each other Imam Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj he passed away in the year 160 and Imam Sufyan al-Thawri passed away in the year 161 so he says that the knowledge of hadith it rested after Imam al-Shu'bah on the shoulders of Hamad ibn Zaid Hamad ibn Zaid was a safeguarder, safekeeper of the knowledge of hadith in the area of Basra after the great Imam Shu'bah ibn al-Hajjaj. Imam Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak from the foremost students of Hamad ibn Zaid, he says in uh, two lines of poetry, in a prose form he says, أَيُّهَا الطَّالِبُ عِلْمًا إِعْتِي حَمَّاد ibn Zaidi تَقْتَبِسْ حِلْمًا وَعِلْمًا ثُمَّ قَيِّدْهُ بِقَيْدِ That, oh, he advises the students of hadith and the students of knowledge at, uh, at that time that O oh, student of knowledge come and seek the knowledge of hadith from Hamad ibn Zaid seek the knowledge of hadith from Hamad ibn Zaid for really taqtab is hilman wa ilman where you will learn from him knowledge and and manners and morals and actions you will learn knowledge and manners and morals and actions from him then it is upon the student of knowledge to preserve this knowledge that he learns from Imam Hamad ibn Zaid by way of his pen, by preserving it on pieces of paper, by writing it and safeguarding it and preserving it. Then we move on to another topic which is pondering upon some of the life events of this great Imam Hamad ibn Zaid some incidents and events and stories that pertain to him to take some lessons and ponder upon these stories Ahmad ibn Abdullah al-Ijli Imam Ahmad ibn Abdullah al-Ijli he says Hamad ibn Zaid thiqatun wa hadithuhu arbaatu alaf hadith kana yahfaduha wa lam yakun lahu kitab that he says that Imam Hamad ibn Zaid possessed in his memory 4,000 ahadith 4,000 ahadith that he had memorized precisely that he had memorized precisely by heart and he did not have a book with him where he had to refer back to to, to revise these ahadith he had memorized these 4,000 ahadith precisely by heart without altering a single letter in these ahadith such was the level of precision and memorization that this great Imam Hamad ibn Zaid he reached Imam ibn Hibban rahimahullah he says kana dariran wa kana yahfaz hadithahu kullahu that Imam Hamad ibn Zaid as we mentioned that he was blind or he became blind near the end of his life and he had memorized all his ahadith by heart. He had memorized all his ahadith by heart. So even when he went blind, 
what the knowledge of hadith that he had preserved and memorized in his heart, he could still teach it, convey it, and relay it. He did not have to depend on someone else to refer back to a book because he had not memorized by heart after losing his sight. Rather, he had memorized everything and put everything to memory by heart and not having a doubt in a single letter regarding those ahadith and he had no need to refer to a book or no need for anyone else after he went blind. Imam Abdurrahman ibn Khirash, he says, Lam yukhte, what was the precision and mem what was the exactness of this great Imam in memorization? Imam Abdurrahman ibn Khirash, he says, Lam yukhte Hamad ibn Zayr fi hadithin qat. That I have never heard Hamad ibn Zayd making a mistake in a single hadith. Making a mistake in a single hadith, a single letter pertaining to any hadith. This was the precision and exactness of his memory and ability to retain. Imam al Zahabi, rahimahullah, he says, La alamu bain al ulama niza'an fi anna Hamad ibn Zayd min aimmat al salaf wa min atqan al huffaz wa adalihim. He says that I do not know amongst the scholars of Islam any difference of opinion that Imam Hamad ibn Zayd is from the great Imams of the Salaf. He's from the foremost Imams of the Salaf. And he's from the most precise memorizers of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the most reliable of the narrators of Hadith of Prophet Muhammad and he Adamihim Galatan. And he is someone who in whose narration and hadith you will not find any mistake. In whose narration of the hadith of Prophet Muhammad, you will not find any mistakes. Alasiat Ma Rawa. In addition to the great number of hadith that he narrated. As we mentioned, even along with the quantity. The great number of ahadith that he had memorized and he narrated, he reached the utmost of precision in his quality. He did not make a single mistake in these great number of ahadith. From the life instances of this great Imam, Imam Hamad ibn Zayd, and what he lived his life upon was that Imam Zahabi, he says, min khasiyat. Hamad ibn Zayd, Annahu la yudallisu abadan. Hamad ibn Zayd, he is from the rare narrators of hadith who never did tadlis. Who never did tadlis. We have talked about this issue in a previous class regarding Imam Shu'bah ibn al Hajjaj, that he was the farthest of the narrators of hadith, of the scholars of hadith, from the matter of tadlis. And we explain tadlis in detail that it is to narrate a hadith that a person has heard from his teacher and his sheikh. There is a sheikh that a person has heard a hadith from him. He has heard a hadith and learned a hadith from him. But a particular hadith he has not heard directly from him. A particular hadith he has not heard directly from him. And we mentioned that there might be several reasons for this, such as that student in that gathering where that particular hadith was conveyed by that teacher to the students, he was absent due to being sick or due to traveling or coming late to that gathering. Or he was present in the gathering, but he fell asleep. And other reasons that the scholars of hadith have mentioned. So he has not heard this hadith from this scholar directly, even though he has heard other hadith. So he comes to one of his colleagues who was present in that gathering and he has heard that hadith from that sheikh. So he hears it, he collects it from that student, then he drops the name of that student. Then he drops this link, hides it, and narrates it directly on the authority of that teacher and sheikh. That teacher and sheikh. And this is what is known as Tadlis. This is what is known as Tadlis. And Hamad ibn Zayd, rahimahullah, he never perform this act of Tadlis that many of the narrators of Hadith and one of the, many of the great Imams of Hadith practiced. They practiced, but Imam Hamad, he never practiced it and he used to say, Qala Hamad ibn Zayd, Al-Mudallisu Mutashabbi'un Bima Lam Yu'ta. That the Mudallis, the narrator of Hadith who practices Tadlis, he is like the one 
who claims to have that which he does not possess, which he has not been given, which he has not been given, meaning the ayah of Allah Azza wa Jal where he says, وَيُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يُحْمَدُوا بِمَا لَمْ يَفْعَلُوا That they like to be praised regarding deeds and actions that they have not, they have not presented and acted upon. So he used to uh, speak harshly about Tadlis that it is claiming that you have something in your position that you have not been given. Because this hadith that uh, the Mudallis narrates on his shaykh directly, then in reality he has not received and heard and learned this hadith from the shaykh directly. Rather, he has heard it from someone else, but he's claiming that he has heard it directly from his shaykh. Here we have a great matter of discussion that we left off in our previous class and we'll discuss it at once here, which is that some of you might ask and some of you who return to the books of hadith, you, you might have this question in your minds that how do we differentiate between the two Sufyans, the two Sufyans that have went with us, Sufyan al thawri and Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And here we have Hamad ibn Zayd and there's another great scholar from the major scholars of hadith in the same area of Basra, Imam Hamad ibn Salama, Hamad ibn Salama, who was older and a, of a higher level in, in, in age than Hamad ibn Zayd. Hamad ibn Salama, he was older and he passed away before Hamad ibn Zayd. But they lived around the same time in the same area of Basra, in the same area of Basra. So in many chains of narrations of ahadith, you will find just the name Sufyan. For example, a narrator will say, Qala haddathana Sufyan, or sametu Sufyanan. Yani, Sufyan has narrated to us. Or he will say, Qala haddathana Hamad. That only Hamad has narrated to us. Which is this Sufyan? Is he a Thawri or is he Ibn Uyayna? Is he Hamad ibn Zayd or is he Hamad ibn Salama? How do the scholars of hadith differentiate between, between who is which? First of all, these narrators, if they're just mentioned by the first name, Sufyan, then they are known as Al-Muhmalin, Al-Muhmal, the narrator who is Muhmal, meaning that there's nothing that has come to differentiate him from someone else. Sufyan, we do not know, just by this word Sufyan, we cannot differentiate between a Thawri and Ibn Uyayna. Hamad, we cannot just differentiate with this word if it's Hamad ibn Zaid and Hamad ibn Salama. Hamad ibn Zaid and Hamad ibn Salama. And as we mentioned, these are scholars around whom the chains of narrations of the Sunnah revolve. They are the great Imams of the Adbaw Tabin around whom the chains of narration revolve. They have narrated thousands of ahadith. In majority of the chains, you will find the names Sufyan or Hamad. So it is a cause of Concern, how do we differentiate between them? So Imam al-Zahabi, rahimahullah, in his great book, Seer Alam al-Nubula, people think that this is just a book of biographies. But when one returns to this book, he will find various benefits in the science of hadith in these books from this great Imam, Imam al-Zahabi. He has talked about this issue in detail in the biography of Imam Hamad ibn Zaid. In the biography of this Imam Hamad ibn Zaid. So he says that... اشترك الحمادان في الرواية كثير من المشايخ وروى عنهم جميعا جماعة من المحدثين because Hamad ibn Zayd and Hamad ibn Salama they lived in the same era and they lived in the same area so they heard hadith from the a lot of the the shiyukh and the teachers are the same and a lot of the narrators who heard hadith from them their students are the same a lot of them are the same then he mentions those teachers who both of them have heard hadith from, such as Anat ibn Sirin, Ayyub al Sakhtiyani, Ishaq ibn Suwayd, and other than them. Both Hamad ibn Zayd and Hamad ibn Salaman narrate hadith from them. And then he mentions their students, those who have heard hadith from both of them, such as Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, and Waki ibn al Jarrah, and Sulaiman ibn Harb, and other than them. They narrate hadith from both Hamad ibn Zayd and Hamad ibn Salama. فَرُبَّمَا رَوَى الرَّجُلْ مِنْهُمْ أَنْ حَمَّادْ 
لم ينسبه فلا يعرف أي الحمادين هو إلا بقرينة that one of these students who has heard hadith from both of them he might narrate a hadith and just say قال حماد حماد has narrated to us relate this hadith to us now we have an issue we do not know which Hamad this is. is if it is Hamad ibn Zayd or Hamad ibn Salama he said the way to differentiate between them is by a karina, is by a proof that is found in the students or in the teachers. A proof that is found in the students or in the teachers. So the proof in the students is that they are students of these two Imams that are special to him, that have narrated majority, major, majority of the hadith they have narrated from one of them from one of them. They have stayed with him. They have sought his hadith over a long period of time and then narrated hadith from him. So he says, وَالْحُفَّاذَ الْمُخْتَصُونَ بِالْإِكْثَارِ بِالْرِوَايَةً حَمَّادِ بِنْ سَلَمَةً بَحْزِ بْنُ أَسَدُ وَحِبَّانِ بْنُ حِلَانِ He names them. That if Bahz ibn Hasad, for example, Bahz ibn Asad, or Hibban ibn Hilal, for example, he says, حَدَّثَنَا Hamad. So in most instances, this means Hamad ibn Salama. Hamad ibn Salama, because they are those narrators that are extremely exclusive and close to their teacher Hamad ibn Salama. They have stayed with him, they have learned a hadith from him, memorized it, preserved it. So if they say Hamad, they more, in most instances mean Hamad ibn Salama. Hamad ibn Salama. The second way to differentiate by way of the students is that he says, Wal muhtasun. بحماد بن زيد الذين ما لحقوا حماد بن سلمة فهم أكثر وأوضح that he said because حماد بن زيد is younger than حماد بن سلمة as we will see soon that حماد بن زيد he passed away in the year 179 after the Hijrah but حماد بن سلمة passed away in the year 167 167 12 years before حماد بن زيد so he's older so they are students major scholars of hadith, narrators of hadith who have not reached Hamad ibn Salama who were young, who did not hear hadith from Hamad ibn Salama who did not reach hadith from Hamad ibn Salama so if one of them was to say Haddasana Hamad, we know for a fact that he is referring to Hamad ibn Zaid he is referring to Hamad ibn Zaid because he was not old enough to learn and hear hadith from Hamad ibn Salama. Then he mentions Imam uh, Az Zahabi examples for that, such as Ali ibn al Madini. Ali ibn al Madini, we just mentioned he was Hamad ibn Zayd's student. And Ali ibn al Madini, his oldest student is Hamad ibn Zayd. He is from the companions of Imam Ahmad, Ali ibn al Madini. He passed away in the year 234. And Hamad ibn Zayd passed away when? 179. 179. Between them is a huge gap. But he sought, started seeking hadith early and the oldest sheikh that he heard hadith from immediately before he passed away was Hamad ibn Zayd. So there's no way that Imam Ali ibn al-Madini heard hadith from Hamad ibn Salama who passed away 12 years before Hamad ibn Zayd. Hamad ibn Zayd. Then he mentions other scholars because they were not old enough. They did, not, they did not exist in the time when Hamad ibn Salama could have narrated and relayed this ahadith. So this is one way, a proof we seek in the students to differentiate between these two uh, Imams who, if they are not differentiated by way of their names, if they are just said Hamad, this is how we differentiate between them. The second is by way of looking at the teachers, by looking at their shuyukh. If we find that the student, he has narrated on both of them. As we just mentioned, some of them, such as Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Abdullah ibn or Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, he has narrated on both of them. So now, how do we differentiate if Abdurrahman Mahdi says Haddasana Ahmad, who is he referring to? We look at the narrator who is before Hamad, this Hamad, his sheikh, his teacher, his sheikh, his teacher. So also in the sheikh, shiyukh and teachers, there are those scholars who one of them has narrated from, not from the other. The other has not or his, his ahadith are exclusive to him. So this is the way how we differentiate. Then Imam al-Zahabi says, if we reach a point where the student 
Both of them have narrated on Hamad ibn Zaid. Uh, the student has narrated on both Hamad ibn Zaid and Hamad ibn Salaman. And the Shaykh, the teacher, is also someone who both Hamad ibn Zaid and Hamad ibn Salaman have narrated on. So now we have an issue. We, we can't find a proof in the students. We can't find a proof in the teacher. So what is the solution in this aspect? He says the solution is that we say that this narrator, Hamad, he is on the condition, he is from the narrators of Sahih Muslim. He is from the narrators of Sahih Muslim. What does he mean by this? He means that Imam Muslim, he has narrated on both Hamad ibn Zaid and Hamad ibn Salama. Imam Muslim has narrated the hadith of both Hamad ibn Zaid and Hamad ibn Salama. So if we say that this is from the narrators of Imam Muslim, either, either one of them, if it is Hamad ibn Zaid and Hamad ibn Salama, then both of them are from the narrators of Sahih Muslim. But we cannot say that this is a narrator from Sahih al-Bukhari. This is a narrator from the narrators of Sahih al-Bukhari. Why? Because Imam al-Bukhari has not narrated hadith except from Hamad ibn Zaid. Hamad ibn Zaid. So this is also a benefit we, we find. If you find in any chain of narration in Sahih al-Bukhari, qala haddathana Hamad, who is he? Hamad ibn Zaid. In Sahih al-Bukhari, if you find Hamad, he is Hamad ibn Zaid. Because Imam al-Bukhari has not narrated any hadith on the authority of Hamad ibn Salama. Hamad ibn Salama. So if we were to say without knowing, now we are... We cannot differentiate by way of the students and by way of the scholar. If we say that this is a narrator from the narrator Sahih al-Bukhari, this is not correct. Because he might be Hamad bin Salama, who for Imam Bukhari has not narrated. But if we say he's a narrator of Sahih Muslim, then this is correct. Regardless of who he is, Hamad bin Salama or Hamad bin Zaid, Imam Muslim has narrated on both of them. What is the reason Imam al-Bukhari did not narrate on Hamad bin Salama? Is there a reason for that? The reason is that Imam al-Bukhari has the highest and the strongest of conditions as to whose hadith, the narrators that he has accepted a hadith from in his book as Sahih. This is the reason that Sahih al-Bukhari is the most authentic book after the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. It has not reached this level and status without these conditions that Imam al-Bukhari has placed upon himself and he followed. That he has an extremely high standard and conditions in the narrators of hadith. It is not enough that they are just reliable narrators. They are trustworthy narrators, they are thiqat. No, he has additional conditions that he does not narrate a hadith except if these conditions are fulfilled. If these conditions are fulfilled. From that, even though Imam Hamad bin Salama is from the well-known thiqat, from the well-known reliable trustworthy narrators. He's from the Imams of the region of Basra. He's older than Imam Hamad bin Zaid, but he has not narrated from him because it is said that Imam Hamad bin Salama, his memory changed a little near the end of his life before he passed away. Near the end of his life before he passed away, he reached the old age, so his memory became a little weak. It changed a little, so he left his hadith. Imam Bukhari did not narrate any hadith from him. This was the, the utmost extreme conditions that Imam Bukhari placed upon himself. This is why Sahih al-Bukhari, without a doubt, is the most authentic book after the book of Allah, Azza, Azza wa Jal. And we have statements from the scholars of hadith proving this, such as Imam Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, he says that, Su'ila Abu Zura, Abu Zura al-Razi, he was asked, an Hamad ibn Zaid wa Hamad ibn Salama, which of them is more precise in memory and more exact in, in retention? He says, Qala Hamad ibn Zaid athbat min Hamad ibn Salama bi kathir asah hadithan wa atqana. That Hamad ibn Zaid, he is a more precise narrator and memorizer than Hamad ibn Salama. His hadith is more correct and more accurate. His hadith is more correct and more accurate. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimullah, he says, Hamad ibn Zaid min a'immatil muslimin min ahl al-deen, as we just mentioned. 
the praise that Imam Ahmad says that Hamad bin Zaid is from the scholars, the Imams of the Muslims, or the people who ascribe to Islam, who are ahabbu ilayya min Hamad ibn Salama. He is more beloved to me than Hamad ibn Salama. Why? Because of his precision in narrating hadith. And as we just heard from Imam Zahabi and others, that he had no mistakes in the vast, large quantity of ahadith that he memorized. He did not make a mistake in a single letter in those ahadith. So Imam Ahmad said he's more beloved. He's a higher memorizer. His level of precision is higher in accuracy, is higher than Imam Hamad ibn, Hamad ibn Salama. Hamad ibn Salama. And this does not mean that Hamad ibn Salama, a'udhu billah, is a weak narrator. He's an unreliable narrator, or he's not trustworthy. This is just comparison between two giants of this, of this field. Two giants. One has reached the pinnacle of memory uh, and ability to memorize and retain an accuracy. And one is a little less than him. One is a little less than him. One is a little less than him. And the same, Imam Zahabi continues, will complete the benefit when he talks about this issue in the biography of Imam Hamad Muzaid in his book, Seer Alam al Nubula. He says, same is the case for the Sufyanin, the two Sufyans, Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Sufyan al Thawri. We look at the students. We look at the students. If you find the student that is, spe is, is specific, more exclusive to one of them, then it is more in. In most cases, he means that sheikh, that teacher. Or if one of them has not reached, has not heard hadith from the one who passed away before, then we know for a fact that he's referring to the one who came after, who one who came after. For example, we just, we just mentioned in our previous lecture, Sufyan al-Thawri, he passed away in the year 161. 161. When did Sufyan al Uyayna pass away? One seventy-nine. So there's a gap of eighteen to twenty years between them, almost eighteen years between them. So if a narrator who's younger who narrates and says Sufyan, it is most likely that he is referring to Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, because he was not present or he was not old enough in a time to have heard and learned hadith from. Sufyan al sawri and he mentions Imam uh, Zahabi examples for that, such as Imam Waqi' and Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi and Al Firyabi and other than them. That they are the young narrators, and if they say Sufyan, then they most likely they mean Sufyan ibn Uyena. Sufyan ibn Uyena. And then we look at the, the proofs in the, in the sheikhs, in the teachers, and we follow likewise for them. And uh, we will take a break here before we continue. If uh, anyone has any questions, then you can uh, ask them, inshallah. If there are no questions, then we'll continue after the break, inshallah. Uh, I just didn't catch the name of who had said it, but uh, they said to seek knowledge and manners from him and to yeah. preserve it. Uh, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. Imam Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. He has these two lines of poetry in which he says, أَيُّهَا الطَّالِبُ عِلْمًا إِعْتِي حَمَّادَ بْنَ زَيْدِي تَقْتَبِسْ حِلْمًا وَعِلْمًا ثُمَّ قَيِّدْهُ بِقَيْدِي I mean, he narrated hadith on the imams of the tabi'een, as we mentioned, that Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, Thabit al-Bunani, etc. I do not know for sure if he narrated hadith on al-Hasan al-Basri, if he reached his life or he was old enough to hear hadith from Imam al-Hasan al-Basri. Because Imam al-Hasan al-Basri, he passed away when? Almost 110. And he was born in the year 98, 99. So he was almost 10, 11 years of age. 
So we have to refer back to the books of Jarwat Adil to find out if he narrated, heard hadith from him at this young age and preserved it. Barakallah feek. So we return back to the biography of this great Imam, the Imam of the Atba'u Tabi'een in the area of Basra in Iraq. And we were just finishing up the benefit that Imam Al-Zahabi Rahimullah has mentioned in his book Seer Alam al nubala in relation to how to differentiate between the two Hamads, Hamad ibn Zayd and Hamad ibn Salama, and the two Sufyan, Sufyan al thawri and Sufyan ibn Uyina, if they are mentioned just by their first name, Hamad and Sufyan. And I had asked you when Imam Sufyan ibn Uyina had passed away, 179 is the year of death of Imam Malik ibn Anas. Imam Malik ibn Anas. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyina passed away even much later. He passed away in the year 198 after the Hijrah. Passed away in the year 198. And as we mentioned, Sufyan al-Thawri passed away in the year 161. So between them is 37 years, not just 18 years or 20 years, 37 years. So without a doubt, the young narrators of hadith, if they were to narrate from someone who passed away 37 years ago, or if they were to say Sufyan, then it's highly unlikely that they reached the era of Imam Sufyan al thawri to hear hadith from him. And Imam al-Zahabi mentioned some of the examples such as Waqi and Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi and Firyabi and Abu Nu'aym, etc. If they say Sufyan, then they mean Sufyan al thawri because they are from the oldest students of Imam Sufyan al thawri He finishes off this benefit by saying, فَعَلَيْكَ بِمَعْرِفَةِ تَبَقَاتِ النَّاسِ After he explains this issue in detail, he says, upon a student of hadith and a student of knowledge to not make mistake in this field is to seek the knowledge of the tabaqat of the narrators of hadith, the le levels of the narrators of hadith, which of them passed away before whom, their level comes before whom, who comes after whom. This is a very important part of the science of the narrator of hadith that it is befitting for a student of hadith to possess in order to not make mistakes and errors in this field, in this field. And I also advise the students of knowledge that the best book that they can refer to, to find out the, the, the levels of the narrators of hadith and who were their teachers and who were their students, as we just mentioned, the way to differentiate between the two Hamads and the two Sufyans is by way of looking at who was the teach students of one of them, who was the teacher of one of them and not the other, exclusive to one of them and not the other. The best book that one can refer to for this is the book Tahzeeb al-Kamal. The book Tahzeeb al-Kamal of Imam al-Mizzi. Tahzeeb al-Kamal fi asma al-Rijal, fi asma al-Rijal of the great Imam, Imam al-Mizzi. Abu al-Hajjaj Jamaluddin al-Mizzi rahimahullah who by the way was the father-in-law of Imam Ibn Kathir. Imam Ibn Kathir, the well-known author of the book Tafsir Ibn Kathir. He was from the foremost scholars of Hadith and he authored this great book Tahzeeb al-Kamal in which he has gathered the narrators of the six books of Hadith and the books that the six Imams, Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim and Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and Nasai ibn Majah have authored in addition to the six books. As we know Imam al-Bukhari, he has some books in addition to Sahih al-Bukhari such as Al-Adab al-Mufrad and Juz Qiraat, Khalf al-Imam in which he has gathered the hadith of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha behind the Imam and Juz Raful Yadain in which he has gathered the hadith of doing Raful Yadain, raising the hands before Ruku and after Ruku. <coughs> Similarly, Imam Muslim has other books than as sahih Imam Abu Dawood and other than them. So he has gathered the narrators of these six Imams from these books in his book Tahzeeb al-Kamal. And he has mentioned everything in, in relation to them from the names and the lineages and the positions of the scholars of Hadith regarding them if they're reliable narrators, 
how precise is his memory, how accurate is his narration, where he passed away, when he passed away, etc. From the most important things that Imam al mizzi has mentioned in his book is that he has tried his utmost best to, na to mention the teachers, the shiyukh of this narrator and the students of this narrator. Every narrator that he mentioned in his book, he has tried to mention all of his teachers, all of his shiyukh and all of his students. And he has ordered them in alphabetical order. He has ordered the narrators in alphabetical order from Alif to Ya. Then the students and teachers for each narrator in each biography has ordered them from Alif to Ya in alphabetical order. So if one refers back to this book, he can find out that if a narrator is a student for, of one of the other narrators, if he has heard a narrator hadith from him, he can find out if one of the narrators is, ha, has a sheikh who he has narrated hadith from by way of this, these biographies. Then we move on to another topic that we always cover in these biographies, which is the aqidah, the itiqad, the creed, the belief system of this great Imam Hamad ibn Zaid and his position regarding that which opposes it from innovations and the people of innovations and misguidance. From his statements showing his steadfastness in adhering to the creed of the Salaf, and as we have mentioned repeatedly, that this is the creed of all of the Imams of the Salaf, all of these great Imams that we have covered, the four Imams that we have just covered before, Imam Malik and Imam Sufyan ibn Uyena and Sufyan al-Thawri and Shorb ibn al-Hajjaj, now Hamad ibn Zaid and other Imams of the Salaf from the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Adbaw Tabi'een and other than them, they are all unified in this, in this matters of belief. There's no difference amongst them in this matters of belief. From that is that Hamad ibn Zaid, he says, كُلُّ مَا إِزْدَادَ صَاحِبُ الْبِدَى إِجْتِحَادًا إِزْدَادَ مِنَ اللَّهِ بُعْدًا that a person of innovation, the more he increases in his belief that he is exerting himself in the worship of Allah, the more he increases in his distance from Allah Azza wa Jal. The more he increases in his distance from Allah. Because a person of innovation, when he is carrying out this innovation, this bid'ah, he is thinking and he deems it that this is something that it will bring him close to Allah Azza wa Jal. That this is worship and obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. But he does not realize that this is increasing him in taking him far away from Allah Azza wa Jal. The more he acts upon this innovation, the farther he, he goes from Allah Azza wa Jal. Imam Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, he says, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ بَصْرِيًّا يُحِبُّ حَمَّادِ بْنِ زَيْدِ فَهُوَ سَاحِبُ sunnah. That if you see a Basri, a person from the region of Basra, if you see him loving Hamad ibn Zaid, then know that he is a person of the Sunnah. Then know that he is a person of the Sunnah upon the proper methodology in matters of creed and in matters of jurisprudence upon the way of the Salaf. This was the, the methodology of these Imams in differentiating between the people of innovation and the people of misguidance. That from the signs of being upon guidance and upon the truth and upon the sunnah is to love the imams of the sunnah is to revere them respect them love them follow their path and way and from the signs of being from the people of innovation is to rebuke them and ridicule them and to mock them and curse them etc so this was from the signs of a person being upon guidance and upon the sunnah that a person from Basra and that area that he loves, Hamad ibn Zaid. We will see some of his positions regarding the various innovations and various deviant misguided groups and sects that arose and that existed in his time, how he dealt with them and what was his position, as was the position of all of these great Imams. Regarding the Rafid the Shia, Hamad ibn Zaid, he says, La in qaddamtu aliyan ala Uthman, la qad qultu anna ashab al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qad khanu. That if I were to give precedence to Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu over Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. If I were to give precedence to Ali or Uthman, then verily I would have claimed that the, that the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa they have been untruthful and deceitful. If, I, if Ali deserved 
to have precedence and he was better than Uthman ibn Affan, then the companions, they would have allocated him as the third caliph. They would have chosen him and deemed him to be the third caliph. But the companions of Prophet Muhammad unanimously appointed and chose and agreed upon Uthman ibn Affan being the third caliph of Islam. This shows that Uthman ibn Affan near them was better than Ali bin Abi Talib. And this is in refutation of the Shia of the Rafida who claimed that Ali bin Abi Talib, he had precedence over Uthman. Rather now, today, the Shia claim that he has precedence over all of the Sahaba. Rather even Prophet Muhammad sallallahu himself and they mock and curse and ridicule and deem the other Sahaba billah, to be disbelievers. To be disbelievers. We see the position of Imam Hamad ibn Zaid regarding the misguided sect and group of the Jahmiyyah. Jahmiyyah. This is a misguided sect and group that, that negates the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal that have come in the Quran and the Sunnah. That, that do ta'til, that render them without meaning. And that do ta'wil, that distort their meanings. So what was the creed of this great Imam in which he's uni united with all the other Imams? He says, Inna ha'ula al jahmiya, inna ma yuhawilun yaqulun laysa fi samai shay. That these jahmis, this misguided sect and group of the jahmiya, the people who are from this sect, they, they try to claim and say that nothing exists in the heavens. The jahmiya, they denied the attribute of Allah Taala being upon his arsh above the seven heavens. They denied it and saying that Allah Ta'ala is everywhere. Allah Ta'ala is everywhere. He is not above the arsh, above the seven heavens. So he is refuting this misguided creed and belief by saying that these people, the Jahmis and those who have followed them in this, they claim that nothing exists in the seven heavens. Nothing exists in the seven heavens. We come to the misguided sect of the Murjia, the Murjia who deviated in the matter of Iman. They claim that actions are not part of Iman and Iman does not increase and decrease by way of which they have opposed the creed of the Salaf, the unified creed of the Sahab and the Tabi'een and these great Imams and those who came after them. He says, Imam Abu Salam al-Khuzai, he says, قَالَ مَالِكْ وَشَرِيكْ وَأَبُو بَكْرِ بْنُ عِيَّاشِ وَعَبْدُ الْعَزِيزِ بْنُ أَبِي سَلَمَ وَحَمَّادِ بْنُ سَلَمَ وَحَمَّادِ بْنُ زَيْد الْإِيمَان الْمَعْرِفَ وَالْإِقْرَارِ وَالْعَمَلِ That these great Imams, they are all united in these matters of creed such as Malik and Abu Bakr ibn Iyash and Hamad ibn Salam and Hamad ibn Zaid they have all unanimously said that Iman is Al-Ma'rifa is Al-Ma'rifa to believe with the heart and al-iqrar to say with the tongue and al-amal and actions of the limbs these three components consist of iman Yahya ibn al-Mughira rahimahullah he says qara'tu kitab Hamad ibn Zaid ila Jarir bin Abd al-Hamid balaghani annaka taqul fil iman bi ziyadah wa ahlu al-kufa yaqulun bi ghayri zalik uthbut ala ra'yik sabbatak Allah that he wrote Imam Hamad bin Zaid wrote to Jarir bin Abdul Hamid. Jarir bin Abdul Hadid, a narrator of hadith in the area of Kufa, in the region of Kufa from Basra. He wrote to him and he said that it has been conveyed to me, relayed to me, that you, even while residing in Kufa, you say that Iman increases. Iman increases. Even though the people around you, the people of Kufa, the major, vast majority of them, they were from the Murjia. They were from the Murjia and they used to believe that Iman does not increase and does not decrease because they believed actions are not part of Iman. A person who increases in actions, his Iman increases. A person who decreases in actions, Iman decreases. This is a creed of the Salaf. But the people of the Murjia, since they exited actions from Iman, they did not believe that it increased and decreased. So he said that it has been related to me, you say that Iman increases even though the people around you in the area in the city of Kufa, majority of them they say that it does not usbut ala ra'yik, stay firm, hold fast to this position. Sabbatak Allah, may Allah make you steadfast. May Allah make you steadfast. This, we benefit from this that 
the people of innovation, even at those times, they were in the majority. The people of innovation and misguidance, even at those times, in those eras when these great Imams lived, even at those times, those Imams and the people on the way of the Salaf, they were very few. They were in the minority. But that did not cause them to waver in their belief and in their methodology and to please the people and to follow their path. Rather, they all stuck to the truth and the path of the Salaf and they advised one another to stay, remain steadfast on this path no matter what difficulties they faced from the people and their communities. And as we just mentioned, a statement of Imam Zahabi that he says, لا أعلم بين العلماء نزاعاً في أن حماد بن زيد من أئمة السلف that we have, there's no difference amongst the scholars of Islam that Hamad ibn Zaid is from the foremost scholars of the Salaf, foremost scholars upon the methodology of the Salaf in creed and in matters of jurisprudence. Then we come on, come to the next topic that we always discuss, which is his methodology in matters of, in fiqh, in jurisprudence, and his ittiba, his following of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam unconditionally unconditionally. Regarding this, we say that we have related this statement to you in the biography of Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna, rahimahullah. We said that Ishaq ibn Abi Israel, he says that Sameetu Sufyan ibn Uyayna wa dhukira indahu Hamad ibn Zayd faja'ala yu'azzim min amrihi thumma qala yarhamuhu Allah in kana la muttabi'an li sunnati rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Hamad ibn Zaid was mentioned in a gathering of Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Imam Sufyan ibn Uyayna after his death. That Hamad ibn Zaid after he passed away, he was mentioned in a gathering of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. So he started to praise him. He started to raise his rank and started to praise him. And he said, may Allah have mercy on Hamad ibn Zaid. May Allah have mercy on him. For verily he was a muttabi'. He was a follower of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After which, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, he said, Milakul amri al-ittiba. Verily, the force, for, foremost of the matters of the religion is al-ittiba, is to follow the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, rahimullah, he says, Lam ara ahadan qat a'lamu bis sunnah. وَلَا بِالْحَدِيثَ الَّذِي يَدْخُلْ فِي السُنَّةِ مِنْ حَمَّادِ بْنُ زَيْدِ That, he says, from all the teachers and scholars I heard hadith from and learned hadith from, I did not find anyone who had more knowledge of the sunnah and more knowledge of which hadith enters the sunnah and which hadith is a proof for matters of jurisprudence and fiqh, which a hadith the ahkam, the rulings of Islam can be derived from than Hamad ibn Zaid. Than Hamad ibn Zaid. Imam Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi also says, Ma ra'aytu a'lam min Hamad ibn Zaid wa Malik ibn Anas wa Sufyan al thawri That I did not from my teachers find anyone more knowledgeable than these three teachers, these three shuyukh, Hamad ibn Zaid and Malik ibn Anas and Sufyan al thawri From all of my teachers, the most knowledgeable were these three. Hamad ibn Zaid, Malik ibn Anas, and Sufyan al -Thawri. Then he continues saying, وَمَا رَأَيْتُ بِالْبَصْرَ أَحَدًا أَفْقَى مِنْهُ يعني Hamad ibn Zaid. That I did not find in the entire vast region of Basra that was, that was filled with the scholars of hadith in that time. He said from the various scholars of hadith that I heard and learned hadith from in that time in the area of Basra, I did not find anyone who had more knowledge of the fiqh the jurisprudence and matters of the religion besides Hamad ibn Zaid who had more knowledge than Hamad ibn Zaid due to him memorizing the most number of ahadith of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the most authentic of ahadith and deriving rulings from him and basing his religion upon them. Yazid ibn Harun rahimullah he says Qultu li Hamad ibn Zaid hal zakar Allahu ashab al-hadith al quran that Imam Yazid ibn Harun, he asked his teacher and his Shaykh Hamad ibn Zaid, did Allah Azza wa Jal, did he mention the Ahlul Hadith in the Quran? Did he mention the Ahlul Hadith, the aided faction and the safe sect in the Quran? So Hamad ibn Zaid, he says, Bala, 
that really Allah Ta'ala has mentioned them in the Quran. <coughs> mentioned them in the Quran. He says, Allah Ta'ala Yaqul, Falawla nafara min kulli firqatim minhum ta'ifa. Then he recited this ayah that Allah Ta'ala says, the complete ayah is that it is not befitting that all of the believers, all of the Muslims, they, they leave in the path of seeking knowledge and in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. Rather, it is upon a group of them to leave and travel in this path of seeking knowledge. Seeking knowledge so that they may return to their people who they had left and so that they may teach to them the rulings of Islam. To teach them, to teach them the matters of religion, the jurisprudence, the rulings of jurisprudence in the religion of Islam. And to warn them and to advise them and to admonish them. So that they, those, their people might fear Allah Azza wa Jal and leave off that which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam Hamad ibn Zaid we see from his understanding of the religion was that he says that the Ahlul Hadith have been mentioned in the Quran and he used this ayah as a proof. This, this statement of Allah Azza wa in the Quran as a proof that these people who live in the pursuit of knowledge, who travel and seek knowledge which is the Sunnah and Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then they return to their people with these Ahadith and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they are the Ahlul Hadith who this derive, extract rulings of Islam from these Ahadith and then teach the people these rulings and warn them and admonish them by way of this Ahadith and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here as we mentioned, Imam Hamad ibn Zaid as we will soon see and we have mentioned he passed away in the year 179. He has mentioned this before 179, this name and this ascription and this label of the Ahlul Hadith. This name and label and ascription of the Ahlul Hadith showing that this is an extremely old name. This was present during the time of the Tabi'een and the Atba'ul Tabi'een and the Salaf, the great scholars of the Salaf, these great scholars of Islam and, uh, and the foremost scholars of Hadith have agreed on the permissibility of using their na this name. They have used it themselves and they have unanimously agreed on using this name and that it depicts the safe sect and the aided group. Then we move on to another topic that we always discuss which is some of the statements of this great Imam, Hamad ibn Zaid, so that we can take some lessons from them and, and ponder upon them. From that is that this saying of Imam Hamad ibn Zaid, he says, Regarding the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, this ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tarfa wa aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. Allah Ta'ala says that, O believers, do not raise your voices above the voice of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he says in the tafsir, in the explanation, exegesis of this ayah, he says, Ara raf as sawt alayhi ba'da mawtihi ka raf as sawt alayhi fi hayati. That I believe, and my position and view is that, Raising the voice over Prophet Muhammad after his death is the same as raising the voice over him in his lifetime. In his lifetime. So then he goes on to explain this by saying, That if what how is raising the voice of, over Prophet Muhammad after his death? The same as raising it over his, uh, over him, over in his lifetime, and this ayah pertains to him in his lifetime. That do not raise your voices over the voice of Prophet Muhammad So how is that done after his death, sallallahu He says that is done if his hadith is related to you, recited to you, narrated to you that the Prophet sallallahu says such and such. He does such and such, so it is upon a Muslim to remain silent and to pay attention to that hadith. To pay attention and remain silent and ponder and learn and uh, revere that hadith. This is the way of not to raise your voice over the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu after his death. After he, his death. From this, uh, we benefit that 
from the worst of manners with Prophet Muhammad وسلم, after his death and raising voices over him وسلم, after his death is that when a hadith of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is, is related to you, narrated to you, is you have is is provided to you, you oppose it by way of personal opinions or personal positions or that such and such imam has said such and such or such a sense scholar has ruled such and such this all enters this prohibition that imam Muhammad ibn Zaid has warned from that to raise the voice over the prophet Muhammad sallallahu after his death and not to respect and revere and stay silent and to accept the hadith of prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam Then we finish off his biography, the biography of this great Imam Hamad ibn Zaid by mentioning the last point in his biography which is his death, Rahimullah. He passed away on the day of Jumu'ah, on the, on the day of Jumu'ah on Friday, the 19th day of Ramadan, the 19th day of Ramadan in the year 179 after the Hijrah, 179 after the Hijrah. Imam Abu Asim al Nabil, Rahimullah, he says that Mata Hamad ibn Zayd yom mat, wala alamu lahu fil Islami naziran fi hayatihi wa samtihi. That Hamad ibn Zayd, Rahimullah, he passed away. And the day he passed away, I did not know anyone in the entire religion of Islam, from all of the Muslims and the followers of Islam who were close to him, who resembled him in his, in his high status and position and in his, in his belief and in his knowledge and his, in his actions. I did not know anyone from the Muslims who resembled them in these aspects. Imam al-Zahabi, rahimullah, he narrated this statement and then added a note to it by saying, مَا تَقَبْلَهُ مَالِكٌ بِسِتَّةْ أَشْهُرْ فَرَحِمَهُمَ اللَّهِ فَلَقَدْ كَانَ رُكْنَاءِ الدِّينِ مَا خَلِفَهُمَا مِثْلُهُمَا He says that before Hamad ibn Zayd passed away the great Imam of Medina, Imam Malik, by six months. Imam Malik passed away before Imam Hamad ibn Salama by six months in the same year, 179, after the Hijrah of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Then he says, Imam al-Zahabi, for may Allah have mercy on both of them, Imam Malik and Imam Hamad ibn Zayd. For verily, they were two pillars of the religion of Islam. Ruknay ad din They were two pillars of the religion of Islam and they did not leave anyone before them who reached their level in, in this great status and position they attained in the knowledge of Islam and in their belief and in their action. They did not raise, leave anyone who could reach such a level. Yazid ibn Zuray, he heard the news of the death of Hamad ibn Zayd, rahimahullah. So he says, Mata al yawma Sayyidul Muslimin. That today has passed away the Sayyid, the leader of the Muslims. The leader of the Muslims, Sayyid al Muslimin. We finish off his biography by this great statement of Imam Uthman ibn Sa'id al Darimi. Uthman ibn Sa'id al Darimi, rahimahullah. He says that, Man lam yajma hadith Shu'bah wa Sufyan wa Malik. Wa Hamad ibn Zayd wa Sufyan ibn Uyayna fa huwa muflisun fil hadith. We finish off the biography of Imam Hamad ibn Zayd and also as a conclusion to the five, four biographies we have covered before him. By this statement of the great Imam Uthman ibn Sa'id al Darimi, he says, The person who has not sought and who has not collected and strived and exerted himself in gathering the ahadith that have been narrated by these five Imams. The five same five Imams that we have just covered until now. Shu'ba ibn al-Hajjaj, Sufyan al-Thawri, Malik ibn Anas, Hamad ibn Zayd, and Sufyan ibn Uyina. If, if someone does not strive himself, exert himself to gather their ahadith, to learn it, to preserve it, memorize it, safeguard it, then he is bankrupt in the, in the field of hadith. For who are muflis fil hadith. As if he has not gathered and learned and collected anything. Has collected anything. This great statement shows that the sunnah of, of the Prophet Muhammad 
that the asanid of this sunnah, the chains of night, it, they revolve around these five imams. They revolve around these five imams. They, they exerted their entire lives to memorizing it, preserving it, narrating it with the utmost of precision and accuracy. So the one who strives to learn their ahadith and gather it, then he has gathered the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. the authentic, the established, the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Imam al-Zahabi, he relayed the statement of Imam Uthman al-Darimi in his book, Seer Alam al nubula then he, then he wrote a note on it, a great note. He says, Wabila raib. This statement is true without a doubt. And he said, Anna man jama ilm haulail khamsa wa ahata bisayir hadithihim wa katabahu aliyan wa nazilan wa fahima ila lahu faqad ahata bishatri sunnah nabawiyya bal bi aksar min zalik. That verily Usman bin Sa'id al Darimi has spoken the truth. The person who strives and exerts himself and collects the ahadith of these five imams, the ahadith that they have narrated, he collects them, compiles them, he writes them, memorizes them, preserves them with all their chains of narrations, and he understands the hidden defects in these ahadith. Then he has collected half of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. He has collected half of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu but be aksar min zalik, rather even more than half, even more than half, showing how the asanid, the, the chains of narration of the authentic Sunnah revolve around these five Imams, revolve around these five Imams. Waqad udima, and this is a great statement of his for us to ponder upon. He says, Waqad udima fi zamanina man yanhadu bihaza aw bi ba'dihi fa nasallallahu al-maghfirah. And he's speaking about his era, his, his era that verily I do not see anyone in my time who is able and capable of doing, undertaking this activity, who is able to gathering the hadith of these imams and memorizing it and preserving it and studying it. I do not find anyone who's able to do that or even some of it in his time, Imam al Zahabi, in his time, Pastor in the year in, in the middle of the 700s century 700 years before us more than 700 years before us and he's speaking about uh, the, the state that knowledge and the knowledge of hadith had reached in his time uh, in his time reside, lived the great imams of hadith such as imam al-mizzi and imam ibn taymiyyah and ibn abdul hadi and other than them so what were he to say what would he say if he saw our times the times that we live in and the state that we have reached in our weakness in seeking the knowledge of Islam, seeking the knowledge of Hadith and the very minute and nothing that we have contributed to Islam and the sciences of Islam. Imam Zahabi he continues by saying, Why then? فَلَوْ أَرَادَ أَحْدٌ أَنْ يَتَتَبَّعَ حَدِيثَ الثَّوْرِ وَحْدَهُ وَيَكْتُبُهُ بِيَسَانِيدٍ نَفْسِهِ عَلَى طُولِهَا وَيُبَيِّنْ سَحِيهَا مِنْ سَقِيمِهَا لَكَانَ يَجِي مُسْنَدَهُ فِي عَشْرَ مُجَلَّدَاتِ He says that amongst these five, if one were to just gather the ahadith and the chains of narrations of Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, of Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, then those ahadith would reach ten volumes. Those chains and those ahadith would reach ten volumes, showing the great magnitude of ahadith these scholars preserved and learned and transmitted and conveyed. وَإِنَّمَا شَانُ الْمُحَدِّثَ الْيَوْمْ الْإِعْتِنَابِ بِالدَّوَامِينَ السِّتَّةِ وَمُسْنَ الْأَحْمَدِ مِنْ هَمْبَ وَسُنَنَ الْبَيْهَقِي وَدَبْ مُتُونِهَا وَأَسَانِيدِهَا That he says, as for the scholars of our times, after he said that no one is able to undertake this task in, in our times, in his times, 700 years ago or more. He says, the most that the scholars of hadith can do in our times is to read the books of hadith, such as the six books of hadith, and Musnad Ahmad, and Sunan al bayhaqi and other than them. Just to read and uh, hold gatherings of reading of these books and giving ijazah in these books. This is the most that the scholars of hadith, they can do in our times, Imam al-Zahabi is saying, in oh, more than 700 years ago. Then he says, ثُمَّ لَا يَنْتَفِي بِذَلِكْ حَتَّى يَتَّقِي رَبَّهُ وَيُيَدِينَ بِالْحَدِيثِ this is a great statement for us to ponder. He says that what is the reading of these ahadith in these gatherings? What is the benefit if one does not fear Allah and he does not follow the hadith of Prophet Muhammad He see that we see gatherings in this time 
that is just being read for barakah, for blessings, and for ijazah, for giving certificates of narrating hadith. And the people are not reading it to ponder and understand and to act upon and to implement and believe in this hadith. So he says, what is the point of that? Then he says, for ala ilm al hadith wa ulama'ihi li yabki man kana bakiyan. So let the one who wants to cry over hadith and the status that it has reached and his people who claim it in his time, let them cry whatever they want to cry. Such is the state that it has reached. Faqad aad al Islam al Mahd gariban kama bada. That Islam verily has returned to being strange as it began. He's talking about 700 years ago. Fal yasa imroon fi fakaki rakabatihi min al nar fala hawla wa la quwata illa billah. So it is upon us to strive and to exert ourselves to free ourselves from the fire of hell and la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Then he finishes off this great statement by saying, Thumma al ilm laysa huwa bi kasrata riwaya. That knowledge of hadith is not by you reciting the books of hadith in these gatherings and the number of gatherings of hadith you have attended that I have traveled to all these countries attending gatherings of hadith and this is how many ijazat and certificates I have in narrating hadith he says this is not knowledge what is, what is, what is knowledge? he says that verily really knowledge is is guidance, light that Allah Ta'ala places in the heart of a believer and its condition and its result is al ittiba is following the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Seeking the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gathering, attending this gathering, seeking ijazat, it is of no value if it is not done for ittiba to follow that or those ahadith. Then he says, وَشَرْتُ وَالِتِّبَاء وَالْفِرَارُ مِنَ الْحَوَى وَالْإِبْتِدَاء that is condition and is, is criteria is al ittiba to follow the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad and to stay far away from ibtida, from innovations, from innovations and desires and misguidance. May Allah guide you and may Allah guide us and you to that which He loves and is pleased with. And with this, we have finished the biography of this great Imam. Imam Hamad ibn Zaid from the foremost Imams of the Atba'u Tabi'een from the foremost Imams of the Salaf in the area of Basra in those times and if anyone has any questions then we can take them As we have just presented and in our previous biographies that the goal and the motivation of these great Imams of striving and exerting and collecting and compiling and learning the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was to put it into action, was to act upon it. And we have presented some great statements from the Imams that have just passed, Imam Malik, Sufyan bin Uraina, Sufyan al-Thawri, Shorba and now Hamad bin Zaid that knowledge is action, knowledge is action so this is the first and foremost uh, goal and objective of treading upon the path of knowledge to act upon it to act upon it No, I, we are talking about the, the time period when a hadith were orally or transmitted, orally learned and received and memorized and then transmitted and conveyed and related and taught orally. This is Asr al-Riwaya, these, these first centuries, the first almost 300 years, three centuries, they are known as the time period where 
this activity of orally learning and preserving the sunnah and then conveying it, relating it, occurred. After the 3rd century hijrah from the 400, the, from the 4th century in the 400s and after it, reliance came, reliance became on the books of hadith. The 3rd century, the two, 200s, the 3rd century is the golden era of hadith and its sciences. In this era existed the majority of the major scholars of hadith. And in this era were authored the most fundamental books of hadith, such as the Masanid, the Musnad Imam Ahmad, and Musnad at tayalisi and Musnad Abi Ya'la, and other books. In this era were authored books of as siha those books that only collect the authentic ahadith, the Musnad. It is a book that collects ahadith of every Sahabi, every companion, individually. So, they, in those books you will find, for example, a hadith of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq in one place, in one chapter, all of his hadith. Then you will find a hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab in one chapter, in one place. Then you will find a hadith of Uthman, likewise. So they collect the hadith of every Sahabi individually, in, in the individual chapters. So majority of the books of Masanid came into existence in this time. Then you have books of Siha, where only authentic hadith were collected. The foremost of them being Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. They existed in the 3rd century Hijri. You have the books of Sunan, those who have only collected a hadith that pertain to ahkam, to, to matters of worship. They have not collected a hadith that pertain to creed, that pertain to tafsir of the Quran, that pertain to the biography of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and other areas. Only matters that pertain to ahkam, matters of worship. So came into existence in this third century Sunan Abi Dawood and Sunan at Tirmidhi and Sunan Nasai, Sunan Numaja, and many various types of books of hadith, the most fundamental books of hadith, they came into existence in the third century Hijri. So the people of the fourth century, they rose in a time where the majority, if not all of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had come to be compiled and had existed in written form, had come to be written and compiled and preserved in written form. So now the shift occurs from auditory, orally learning and teaching a hadith to reliance upon books, to reliance upon books. So from the fourth century onwards, you will see that instead of this activity of the scholars of hadith traveling to the teachers, learning a hadith orally, then traveling and teaching a hadith, this changed, the people would just grab a book of hadith that has been written before them, such as Sahih al-Bukhari, and they would hold a large gathering in which thousands of people would attend, and this book would be read in a few days. And then ijazah, permission to narrate this book, would be given to the student on the hadith so that he can narrate it. So the shift have occurred from narrating individual hadith, memorizing, preserving it, to narrating books by way of ijazah, by way of permission. And this is the way that has continued until our times. We are upon this time. No one today narrates a hadith on Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, with this chain of narration that he has heard from his Shaykh. Between him and between Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are 20 or 25 narrators. The most you will find today is people have ijazat, the students of hadith. They have permissions that their Shaykh has authorized them, given permission to narrate, for example, the six books of hadith. So this is what has occurred due to the circumstances that necessitated and the, and the historical changes that occurred. So sunnah came to be preserved in the books of hadith and we have now the sunnah preserved in these books and we now preserve these books from any additions, subtractions, any alterations and then narrate it, conveying it to the people after us. Conveying it to the people after us. Yeah. It has like the six narrators from the six books of Ahadith, so yeah. are there any books which are from Sahih al-Bukhari narrators? Yeah. There are many books. There are many books that if one were to refer, for example, if one, one, one wants to just find out the narrators of Hadith that are mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, that are mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, or they want to find out the narrators that are just mentioned in Sahih Muslim or 
he wants to find out the narrators that are mentioned in both the Sahihin, the Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim. So you have many books for that, for that uh, field. So for Sahih al-Bukhari, for example, you have the book of Imam al-Kalabazi, Imam al-Kalabazi, Rijal Sahih al-Bukhari, in which he has collected the narrators that Imam al-Bukhari has mentioned in the chains of narration, Sahih al-Bukhari, mentioned their biographies, mentioned their dates of birth, where they were born, their teachers, their students, the rulings of the scholars of hadith upon them, uh, their death, where they passed away, all information that a student of knowledge would need uh, about this narrator. For example, in Sahih Muslim, you have the book of Ibn Manjuya, Ibn Manjuya, Rijal Sahih Muslim, Rijal Sahih Muslim, in which he has collected the narrators of hadith that Imam Muslim has mentioned in his book, Sahih Muslim. Everything pertaining to the narrators you can find in this book. Then you have books that have compiled both this narrator, both the books of a Sahihin, the narrators of both these books, such as the book of Abu al-Fadl, Muhammad ibn Tahir al-Maqdisi, Ibn al-Qaisarani. Ibn al-Qaisarani, he has a book, Rijal al-Sahihin. In that book, you will find the narrators of hadith that both the Shaykhain, Bukhari and Muslim had mentioned in the Sahihain. So, there are individual books for Sahih Bukhari, for the narrative of Sahih Bukhari, for the narrative of Sahih Muslim, for the Sahihain. There, there are some books that have collected just narrators of the Sunan. For example, there are books just for Sunan Abi Dawood, they are narrators, or Sunan at tirmidhi There are books for the four Sunans, and there are books for the six books of Hadith. The foremost of them is Tahzib al-Kamal. Tahzib al-Kamal is the most beneficial of these books that a student of knowledge should refer to and benefit from. Last year you mentioned that uh, the, these narrators have like tabakat level. So Imam Bukhari only takes from level 1, yeah. Imam Muslim takes from level 1 and level yeah. 2. So is there any book where they are arranged according to these levels? The scholars have written books that talk about the conditions are and the methodologies of these great Imams in their books. So, from these books are books such as Shurut al Aimma al Khamsa, Shurut al Aimma al Khamsa, and Shurut al Aimma al Sitta. Conditions and the methodologies of the, of the six authors of Hadith, the Qutb al Sitta, in their books. The six books of hadith. The six books of hadith of Imam al Hazimi and other than them, in which they have talked about these conditions and talked about the, the tabaqat, the, the levels of these narrators of hadith. The examples we mentioned in our last year's uh, class were from these books, from these books of Shurut al Aim al Khamsa and Shurut al Aim al Sitta and other than them. Time we are studying all the moms, they didn't have any books or, uh, or the books never made to us. These are, these are the aimma of the Atbaw Tabi'een and those after them who came before the era where the Sunnah was widely compiled and written. As we find out, most of them they passed away before the 200 uh, year after the Hijrah. The books, as we mentioned, is the era of compiling and writing the Sunnah vastly occurred in the 200s, in the 3rd century. So these, we, we talk about these Imams because they were the safeguarders and the preservers of the Sunnah until this time. The Sunnah had continued for two, three generations. They, they exerted themselves and sacrificed everything to preserve the sunnah safely in this last period where innovations and misguidance and various other developments and phenomena occurred that could have affected the hadith of Prophet Muhammad So they are the ones who safeguarded and preserved it and then in the end of their times the writing of the sunnah came into existence in vast uh, amounts. Some of them have written books such as Imam, Watta, uh, Imam Malik, Imam Malik who passed away in the same year as Imam Hamad ibn Zayd, 179. 
rather six months before him as we just mentioned but he has compiled the sunnah and the hadith that he has collected in Medina he has compiled the book al muatta which is alhamdulillah present amongst us and printed and well known some of them had books but they conveyed the knowledge of these books to their foremost students such as Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan then these scholars conveyed it to the scholars who came after them, who compiled them, who collected them in written form such as Imam Ahmad, Imam al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim so they preserved it, they safeguarded the sunnah from changes and alterations and the trials and tribulations that afflicted these times conveyed it to the foremost reliable trustworthy students who conveyed it to the people who compiled it who com com conveyed it to the people who compiled it some of them as, as we said they had books some of those books reached us some of those books have not reached us such as Sufyan ibn Uyayna Rahimullah and other imams that we have mentioned they had some books they conveyed the knowledge to the students the students they safeguarded preserved it but what they had written also, that did not reach us. The manuscripts did not reach us. Or they themselves, upon their death, as we mentioned for Imam Shurab ibn al-Hajjaj, that they advised with washing away those, those books, or by burying it, or by burning it. Because they deemed that the knowledge that is preserved in the heart of trustworthy, the utmost trustworthy of narrators, their students, it can never be altered and changed. But the books, if they were to fall into the hands of those who are untrustworthy, then it could be added to, subtracted to. So they did not deem it safe to leave these books. So some of them themselves, they buried these books, these books or, bur or burned them or washed them away, washed the ink away. But they conveyed their knowledge to trustworthy narrators from the great Imams that we'll cover in our future classes, from the future the coming tabaqas, coming levels such as Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi, Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Qattan, Imam Ahmad and other than them who carried on this knowledge until it was safely preserved and written. Safely preserved and written. So in, Imam, in the books of hadith that we have amongst us, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, you will find several chains of narrations that Imam Bukhari narrates for example on his teacher, on his teacher Ali ibn al-Madini. And then Ali ibn al-Madini narrates on his teacher Hamad ibn Zaid, Hamad ibn Zaid. So Hamad ibn Zaid conveyed this knowledge to the most utmost precise, accurate, memorizer and trustworthy student Ali ibn al-Madini who conveyed to Bukhari who preserved it in written form. So this is a succession that happened uh, in the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and we have this Sunnah preserved with us because of it being written. If these Imams had not rushed towards writing it and compiling it, then our memories and our abilities today we're not capable of preserving it as they preserve it, uh, preserved it for us without any alteration <laughs>